we're back to talk about Huawei's new phone, the Mate 60 Pro, and how this is going to affect Qualcomm, one of which was one of our top choices in stocks for 2023. Yesterday, we talked about Huawei and the 7 nanometer chipset that's in the phone, as well as the 5G modem that is in this new Huawei phone. So today we're going to go into a little bit more depth about how this affects Qualcomm and how this affects us as investors in Qualcomm. Yes. So uh, Casey, you've got a link to the video we did yesterday where we talk about this in a little bit more depth, but just a high level overview as to provide some background on what we're talking about. So you mentioned this Huawei seven nanometer chip, which seven nanometers, the smaller the size, the more powerful and more energy efficient the chip is. It was previously thought that seven nanometers and smaller could only be accomplished with an ASML, extreme ultraviolet lithography machine. Now, several years ago, the sale of those EUV machines was restricted to mainland China, mainland China does not have any EUV machines. There was some speculation that maybe they got hold of one or that maybe Huawei figured out a way to make their own EUV machine and completely cut ties with ASML. But that is absolutely not the case. The seven nanometer chip was probably made using DUV, deep ultraviolet, the previous manufacturing generation technology. And so the breakthrough here is that they probably figured out how to do this using what's called double patterning and multi-patterning techniques using the DUV machines. Again, link to the video uh, to yesterday on why this is significant for ASML and what that means for the industry going forward. But as you mentioned, Casey, yields using this double patterning and multi-patterning techniques are probably very low. Let's talk about how this affects Qualcomm and how Huawei's breakthrough and SMIC's uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing International's breakthrough affects Qualcomm and how it doesn't affect Qualcomm. We pulled this chart from Qualcomm's 2022 annual report, and we're going to talk about why this is such an important discussion in the first place. You can see from the chart in 2022, China, including Hong Kong, comprised about two thirds of Qualcomm's total sales, 28 billion dollars out of 44 billion dollars so huge portion of the revenue but i'm going to read this one sentence to you which is very important it says china revenues could include revenues related to shipments of integrated circuits for a company that is headquartered in south korea but that manufactures devices in china which devices are then sold to consumers in europe and or the united states so nick can you explain this statement and why is it so important? Yeah, Casey, we wanted to point this out because yes, it looks like the vast majority of Qualcomm's revenue is derived from China, but the important caveat to this, as you just read in that sentence, Qualcomm does not recognize revenue based on where the actual final device is sold. It recognizes revenue based on the location of the factory it sells its chips to. And these factories are where they assemble the chips into a final device. For example, Samsung, a South Korean company, is a top Qualcomm customer. They buy chips, Snapdragon processor chips, a 4G and 5G modem and, and other connectivity chips. They buy them, but so many of the actual chip assembly and device assembly factories are actually located in mainland China. So it's a South Korean company buying the chips, but they assemble them into, let's say, a smartphone or a tablet in mainland China, and then they go on to be sold in, again, Europe or North America. So it's not that Qualcomm is actually selling most of its chips for the mainland China end market. It's just that this is where most of its chips are purchased for final assembly into a computing system, into a, a device. So I think this is an important caveat here that a lot of folks, a lot of investors, including many on Wall Street, maybe haven't fully grasped. Yeah, this is absolutely an important point because 
on the surface, it looks like all of the revenue is coming from China, but really all of these smartphones are obviously being sold in many other countries, not just China. Let's talk a little bit more about the 5G connectivity chip and whether or not that is going to have a large effect on Qualcomm's revenue going forward. Yes. So this next slide we put together, a really important, Casey, because it would seem that the market thinks Huawei is not just going to cut Qualcomm out of the processors, but also 5G chips, because that Mate 60 Pro had the seven nanometer processor, but also a 5G modem in it, which is a first for Huawei. That being said, this also was not new news. Two quotes here from CFO Akash Pakawala from the Q3 fiscal 2023 earnings call. This is almost two months ago now, and I'll just quote him. As you were aware, we have a 4G license for shipping into Huawei. We do not have a 5G license, and we are not assuming any material revenue going forward. This is an important point. Quite some time ago, Qualcomm and other companies were actually banned by the U.S. to sell 5G modems and chipsets to Huawei. They've never gotten 5G revenue from Huawei. They were getting 4G revenue and related Snapdragon chipset sales to Huawei, but Qualcomm already removed all Huawei revenue from their guidance. The second quote we have is at the Deutsche Bank Tech Conference, so August 31st, and we'll focus in on this second paragraph. He says, we don't have a license to sell 5G to them, to China. So they'll have to find another source if they want to launch 5G devices. And that's the process we're going through. You're hearing the same rumors that we're hearing, and they're trying to accomplish that. We'll see how it plays out. Now we are starting to see how this is playing out. If we back up to the first paragraph, he says, as a result, we only had a license from the U.S. government to sell 4G chips to them. So along with 4G, we're selling processors as well as an integrated chipset. So all of this has been baked into the guidance for the upcoming year. Qualcomm was already very well aware of these restrictions and has included that in the guidance for us as investors and for the business. Yeah, this is super important, Casey. This is all known information. It shouldn't have been a surprise to the market. But here is one reason there could be some risk for Qualcomm. So later in the week after the Huawei phone came out, um, China also started putting restrictions on state employees that they could not use iPhones uh, at work. So, so there's this growing risk that some have that perhaps China is going to be cutting Qualcomm and, and other U.S. chip makers out of the mix entirely in favor of a domestic company production. Now, this is a potential risk. But again, not new information. For quite some time now, we've known about China's goal. It's called Made in China 2025. And they've had this goal to have 70% self-sufficiency by year 2025, meaning uh, they would like to source 70% of chips in devices sold in mainland China, manufactured in China. So again, this has been around for a while, but the risk here is that a lot of the end devices actually sold in China. Again, this is not the two thirds total revenue that Qualcomm reports because not all of that reported revenue are for devices that end up getting sold in China. It's just that they're assembled in China. But again, the risk is that maybe this Huawei Mate 60 Pro with the seven nanometer processor and the 5G chip is indicative of China's progress. They're making progress in becoming more self-sufficient with their own internal manufacturing of chips and assembly of chips. And again, like we talked about on the last video, Casey, with ASML, it looks like mainland China has been stockpiling DUV machines from ASML, probably for this reason exactly. They know that the yields on this multi-patterning process that they're using with DUV is not very good. So they need a lot of DUV equipment to get this production up and running and off the ground. It's potentially a money losing operation at this point to do so. However, also this week, China announced and the equivalent of 41 billion US dollar investment in support of its 
internal chip manufacturing uh, capabilities. So I think the risk here is China is really, really doubling down on this breakthrough from Huawei and SMIC in producing its own processors for smartphones and its own 4G and 5G wireless connectivity chips for devices that eventually get sold in mainland China. And so potentially Qualcomm loses out on this business over the long term. Of course, this isn't a slam dunk for the for Chinese manufacturers at this point. As we pointed out, the yield on these wafers is much less, so they're going to have to produce many, many more wafers to mass produce the seven nanometer chip that will go into phones. Well, that remains to be seen. Ultimately, the technology is not available in China to mass produce these wafers at this point. Yeah. So I, I think supply is, is a key factor here, Casey. And as you pointed out in the last video and should be reiterated here is that those Mate 60 Pros with the seven nanometer chip in it actually sold out very quickly. So another indication that there's really not that many of them available on the market. Something worth monitoring. Also, this is just Huawei. There's plenty of other Chinese smartphone manufacturers as well. Xiaomi, for example, uh, that may continue using Qualcomm as a supplier, uh, both for devices that are eventually going to be sold in mainland China and also for devices sold uh, outside of mainland China. So it, again, like you said, Case, this is not a done deal that, that China's cutting tight with Qualcomm and other chip makers located outside of mainland China. Second point we'll look at is in the final paragraph of this statement from Akash Pakawala at the Deutsche Bank conference. He says about Qualcomm, our roadmap on technologies, especially CPU and AI is very strong as we go forward. So we think we're in a great position. Our OEMs obviously have picked up a lot of the share that Huawei had before. And these OEMs are looking forward to great launches. So it's already included in our guidance, and we're just looking forward to working with our partners for new phone launches. So Qualcomm, well positioned with their edge, leading edge technology. Yeah, great point, Casey. So I, I think maybe just to reiterate the two counterpoints that we've presented here as to why Qualcomm is not as bad off as the market is starting to think it may be. First, uh, the Made in China 2025 goal, not as big of an impact on Qualcomm as it may appear based on that almost two-thirds of revenue based in China because of the yield on wafers that China probably is trying to deal with right now. And also because you know not all of those sales end up in devices sold in mainland China. It's just that they're assembled in mainland China. And then the second counterpoint here, Qualcomm still very much a technological leader in chip design. And so that's a big factor. It's not just about, uh, about politics and a national pride, be that US or Chinese. A lot of this is ultimately going to come down to business decisions from smartphone manufacturers, who's the leader in technology and who's competitive on price for that leading technology. And so Qualcomm still a, going to be very, very compelling supplier for these smartphone manufacturers in mainland China going forward. As I mentioned earlier, Qualcomm was one of our top picks for 2023. Nick, does that still stand? Is Qualcomm still in September 2023 one of our top picks? No. Casey, a couple months ago, we did talk about how long-term you and I personally are still bullish on Qualcomm. But I think through multiple videos now we've communicated, we thought that the expected rebound for Qualcomm's business is being delayed into calendar year 2024. So still very much a stock that is part of our portfolio. It could be very cheap. This is still a very highly profitable business. They pay a dividend, they repurchase stock. But as far as a return to growth, the business has pushed back an expected rebound into calendar year 2024. CFO Akash Palkawal has made that very clear, I think, in recent commentary, and we're on board with that. The data seems to support that. So no longer a top 
need to own stock for 2023, but perhaps maybe that will start to change in 2024. So stay tuned, folks. We'll have more updates for you on that soon. Next week, we'll talk about a few more stocks that are on our portfolio watch list or buy list. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and don't miss a video. Make sure you have notifications enabled. And we will see you next week here at Chip Stock Investor.